sing my moments and my days. Ceaseless praise, ceaseless praise. Take my heart, it is your own. Royal throne, royal throne. Take my voice and let me sing for my king, for my king. Take my Two steps backwards, heart out of my chest, serving my emotion led backwards. Lucky, lucky me, I said, bitter never breaking bread backwards. Seems I've failed this test, living like I'm still not blessed. Blessed, I'm sick and tired of losing track. Keep stacking sticks to pay the So sick and tired of falling back. So I'm trying tricks to face the fact. Guess I took the wrong way back. Shut the fuck and hit the ground. But I took the wrong way down. Nobody, dude, nobody just picked a topic like deal because they're actually experiencing zeal for the Lord. It's, you picked a topic like that because you were eaten up with conviction and boredom and apathy and passion and all of those things were just like 
They were, they were all swirling around and shit. Like, I gotta do something. Like, and the word veal popped in. That's my guess. But flat on the inside. God. Oh, we get there. Thank you. 
When you're in or out, when it's us or them, and we shame the doubt, is it all a lie? All we ever really need is love. There's no need to shed more blood. Look upon the cross.
morning. Welcome to the Grove. I uh, am, am I on? There we go. All right. Hey, good to see you guys. Welcome again to the Grove. Great to be here with you today. Great to have one of my most favorite people on the stage with me this morning, Liz. It's good to have you here. Um, Liz, <laughs> just kidding. Justin, uh, obviously, um, love having Justin here with us this, this week. And so, um, a couple announcements real quick. One is tonight from 6 to 8 p.m., the teens are doing karaoke night. Um, and so if you love karaoke and you're a teen or you feel like you could pretend to be a teen and you want to come hang out and listen to some karaoke, 6 to 8 p.m. here, Matt and Nicole will be back, um, and uh, I think pizza and drinks. And so if you're middle school, high school, and you want to hang out, um, 6 to 8 tonight, karaoke night. Um, the next announcement is, 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 is really big for us. Um, uh, several years ago, um, you know, we've, well, this last year, we've made, a, we've made a journey. We've been a part of moving into um, what is called full inclusion of the LGBTQ community, and it's been a journey for us. But about five, six years ago, I had mentioned this to Justin, um, and he said to me, hey, I'd love to, I'd love to document that. I'd love to, to, to film that, that journey for you. And we kind of we shelved it for a moment, and then COVID hit. Um, as we came out of COVID, um, last summer, um, I, I said to Justin, I said, listen, you know, this fall, um, I think we're going to make the announcement and move in this direction. And uh, he said, well, let's, let's get it on film. And that end of that summer, Wild Goose Fest had moved from its normal July date and moved to um, September. Um, Justin joined me there, um, and we pulled out the camera, and we started filming conversations that we were having. Um, brought it back to here and started filming some uh, interviews with uh, many of you and with the elders and things like that. And so um, we've been, or I say we, they, uh, Ben, um, uh, Justin and my, my new friend David have been working hard for the last several months putting something together because we want to be able to tell this story not in any kind of um, congratulatory or south back padding, but just because we know the story um, is important, and we want to help other churches and other people be able to tell the story or give them courage to to maybe do the same thing. And so they've been putting some stuff together. So I want to invite David Wilkinson, and Justin's already on stage with me. Grab that orange mic for David, um, and they're going to share just real quick, briefly about what um, they're going to set up a clip, and they're going to they're, we're going to show you that clip and kind of see uh, where we're at. But um, here you go. Thanks. So yeah, so um, Jeff shared uh, the the genesis of this project and uh, it's been really cool to be uh, able to put this together and we just kind of wanted to say thank you to the community here for letting us um, come and uh, put cameras in your faces and um, some of you we were able to sit, sit down with individually and to uh, get your story and be, you, you were very vulnerable with us and uh, it just adds so much to the story that we're trying to tell, which is which is the story of the Grove and uh, how you have um, come to where you are today. And uh, so I just want to say thank you so much. Um, we have a clip here. This is about, uh, I don't know, midway to three quarters of the way through the film. It's about a 90 minute film at this point. And, um, and this is kind of the uh, ramp up to the announcement on October 3rd of 2021. Um, and you'll kind of get some, a little bit of behind the scenes from the elder meeting um, as they're discussing how they're, they want to go about get, you know, uh, announcing this to the community, how they want to do it in the church. And we also have some, some experts that we talk to uh, on the subject. Uh, and they're going to be, you'll see them uh, in here. They're not titled um, because they're titled earlier in the film. So, um, but you'll see that. But I want to introduce David. David, uh, we <laughs> we, we've been talking to this uh, distribution company and we had a timeline that was much further out than what they were wanting to do for us. And so they were like, hey, could you get us a rough cut in like four weeks? And we had- We were thinking like the fall. We were, so. Yeah, we were kind of thinking. Anyway, so David uh, spent several nights uh, editing and, and getting to know some of you very well. You don't know David, but he knows you all very well um, that are part of the film. So I just want to say, introduce David and say thanks, David, for your work. and. Uh, and if you have anything to say. I, I just want to say thank you. I mean, sincerely, to be able to be um, a part of this project. I mean, we've been telling people stories for quite a long time. Uh, we've collaborated for a while. Um, but this is truly one of those scenarios where it's been life-giving to me. So we hope that when it's done uh, and it's able to be shared, that it will mean something to you because it's really meant something to me. So I just 
I thank you for that. Also, as an editor, if you don't mind humoring me, it's not finished as far as color and uh, audio and all of that. If you can make sense out of what everyone's saying, I feel like it was a win. But anyways, thank you for letting us be here. Yeah. We really appreciate you. All right. I think uh, here's the clip. I like to spend some time putting some words to things that we want to say, some of the questions that we want to be prepared for, and um, just anything else that what to expect kind of a thing. There's just kind of an art of communication that says I'm gracious or says you're wrong. And I think we need to land on the I'm gracious. Uh, those of you that are non-affirming, you know, we're going to commit to not saying that you just hate gay people. How can we communicate to people that we understand you might not be here tomorrow, you might not be here in six months, but will you commit to the journey? Or, oh, you, you affirm gay people, so why do you hate the Bible? You know, like, uh, understanding that those, those two things won't get us anywhere. So the way we respond has to also reflect that we're choosing the side of love. We've done a lot of this work, much still to do, but I have to remember it's my personal responsibility to unlearn, and it's okay to unlearn. We are taking gentleness and care as we walk through this, and there's going to be some personal responsibility required here. Most, if not all, theologians that have walked through this, no matter where they land, affirming, non-affirming, would, would agree with this piece of it, that this is not a matter of your salvation. It's not just permission, but just like, you're going to be okay. Like, you're not going to lose your salvation if you question. And I guess in my mind, when I think of acceptance, I already am affirming, right. but maybe that's right. not with everybody. But affirming for us would be that we could perform same-sex unions and that we could hire as staff, even pastors, right. LGBTQ+. Yeah. Plus. And so one of the things that challenged the elders right away was, if you look at scripture and you don't know like what it says or why it says it or anything like that, and you're okay with condemning people to hell, like are, that are friends and family, and you don't, I feel like just for yourself, you should really look into that to know because that's a huge thing you're doing there. People say, do you not believe in the authority of scripture? Well, yes, but I don't believe in the authority of your interpretation. I mean, which of the 40,000 Protestant denominations am I gonna pick? I just think dispositions of heart like humility and an openness to go back to the text with that measure of courage Dispositions of heart are more important than positions of theology. What does Jesus, you know, say uh, about f about fruit producing things, and has our church tradition produced fruit? Those internalized lessons around shame, around hell, are still there. They didn't go anywhere. The tape is still playing. We've kicked people out, or we've shamed them, or we've called them abomination, or we've ex-gay ministries of trying to change people. It's embarrassing. And I think that's true on issues of race, on issues of gender, on so many issues. We have a whole bunch of people who are far more interested in protecting theologies than they are protecting people. And I never remember Jesus saying, love your idea as yourself, ever. Has our tradition done very well with this? I would say no. What I say when people say it's clear is, you know, our history doesn't indicate that. Our history tells another story. Our history tells a story where we need to be more concerned about humility than we do certainty. So what has our experience been? And I think all of us, we looked at our experience and it's like, man, our experience doesn't, doesn't fit what we have been, right. you know, framed. And so that's not, not my experience. And so my experience is, is causing me to question these things. You might say ordinary secular people don't understand what the fuss is about because they don't have scripture and tradition to tell them there should be a fuss. They're able to just process that experience like regular human beings do. You know, um, here's a person and they're wired differently and, and it hurts if they're treated with contempt and so we shouldn't treat them with contempt and they wanna have relationships like we do and they ought to be treated equally that seems pretty logical, right? Um, but that is a logic that is not the dominant logic if you're within the religious community because we have all of this other stuff of scripture and tradition and 
and how the churches have always done it and things like that. And then you look at reason and, you know, if it wasn't, and just think for a second, if we didn't have those six verses in the Bible, does reason get you to think it's abomination without those verses? If it wasn't for what my understanding was when I was a kid, um, I would never, I don't think I would ever think that. The gospel is supposed to be good news. So if I read this text and I can't find any good news, if what I'm saying the text says is all bad news for somebody, I need to take a second look. To leave the 99 and go after the one, or to stand with the marginalized the way Jesus did, feels like a God thing, doesn't it? I decided that that's what I wanted. I couldn't live with myself any other way, actually. I could not live with myself any other way. If I was gonna to have to be in church that was not inclusive, I could not live with myself. I had to, I had to take a stand. Um, you know, I'm doing my best to give grace and you guys do your best to give grace because uh, you know, I think we're all carrying this weight you know, differently than others. And so we'll need that from each other um, because we'll probably get some, you know, some outside uh, rocks thrown. And so we just need to be able to um, just have each other's backs on those kind of things. So obviously that's just a small snippet, small clip of the, the film. Um, many of you made the film and did interviews and you, you didn't see yourself on there. I know that we have um, you know, um, some exciting times ahead of us to see, see some of that and to see some of your stories uh, on screen. And so I hope you're excited about it. We're excited about getting our story out and um, be able to share that with others. Um, we're gonna kind of uh, switch gears here and kind of head into what today's gonna look like. Um, we have a special guest with us. Um, um, his name is Stan Mitchell. Some of you have met him before. He was here um, back in the fall, and you saw him just on screen here a moment ago. But we're going to talk a little bit about um, this idea of progressive Christianity. And that might be a whole new phrase for you. You've never heard it, or you have heard it, and you really kind of don't know what it means. Um, we've used a little bit of that language over the last few months. Um, but this week, I had a couple people um, uh, th that had reached out to the church through uh, Facebook Messenger, and as well as I met someone in the parking lot. They both kind of asked this question about our church, uh, our system of beliefs, or what kind of church we were. And um, when I hear those questions, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about this in a moment, but when I hear those questions, my mind um, goes back to a lot of times where people have uh, approached us and asked us questions not to um, see where they fit in, but see where they kind of fit out, where they want to get out of here and find a reason. And so they ask those questions. And, and so we're going to talk a little bit about that. But what I want to ask you guys um, for a moment to get a chance to share with those around you is we're going to look back at our church history, like myself, you know, what I grew up in, what kind of church it was, much different than this church. So uh, my belief systems were shaped and formed by the church I grew up in. Um, as a kid, it was a Pentecostal Assemblies of God church um, that both Jody and I grew up together in. Um, so as far as I re can remember, I've always been a part of that one denomination, went to a college that was that denomination. Um, and then ended up going into what was called non-denominational, and it was kind of a buzzword in that, in that time frame when I left school, um, into where we are now. But I want you to take a moment and say hello to the person next to you, and just tell them maybe what is your church history experience? Like what kind of church did you grow up in as a kid? Was it a Methodist? Was it one of the mainline Protestant churches, Catholic, um, something like that? What, where did you grow up? Maybe you'd say, hey, I, I didn't grow up in church at all, and so I don't have that baggage that you have, um, but, which is great, awesome. You have other baggage, but uh, um, but maybe share real quick, say hello, and then just share what was your maybe your experience growing up in church? What kind of church was it? What was maybe the denomination? And then we'll come back together and we'll do some worship. Parents.
So we're going to come back together here and move into a time where we are worshiping together, singing, and kind of taking some of our conversation, kind of switching gears a little bit. So I hope that based on hearing everybody talking, that you're able to learn something about someone that was sitting next to you, perhaps where they've come from and where they've been and where their journey has taken them. And one of the things I love about this community that we have learned and emphasized, I think, pretty well, is that we are all different and we come from very different places. And that this is an opportunity for us to come together as one, um, to worship together, and uh, to, to make this place a home for everyone. So I'm going to ask you guys a little bit of help. I know some people are still... I guess I'm learning a lot about church tradition, where you came from. <laughs> but if you could help me out for a second, we're going to do a short call to worship, and you're going to see on the screen uh, a line that we're going to ask for you to read together. So I'm going to be reading the voice of one, and then where you say see all, we're going to uh, we're going to read that together. So I would I would invite you to stand if you're comfortable doing that. I would love you to join me in standing. We come to this service with so many needs and longings. We've been many different places, conceived many different thoughts. But underneath all our differences is the same basic need for love and acceptance. And that's why we are here, to admit to each other our need for love and to celebrate the most marvelous fact of the universe that God loves us and accepts us just as we are. Alleluia. Join us in worship.
So on your tables, you'll see a small uh, yellow card, and it is uh, the prayer that we're going to be reading, if you want to pick that up, um, just so you can follow along with the words. So one of the things uh, about this journey, this story that we've been kind of unfolding over the last several months, the last several years, I think for me, um, a main, a main area of significance is for me to continue to come back to my con connection and my relationship with Jesus. So asking the question, who do I say Jesus is? When I consider scripture and tradition and experience and, and, and all those things kind of put together, and ultimately my experience of Jesus is love. And that's who I know to, to be true in my life and what I know to be true for me. And so we're going to 
read these words together, and I would invite you to, if you can, um, if you can squint or if you need your glasses, but otherwise, just listen and follow along. We're going to read this prayer that says, Who do I say you are, Jesus? Who do I say you are, Jesus? Sometimes I think I know, and I eagerly praise you. I confess that I have learned to know God because of you. I celebrate the fact that my life is fuller because of you. I recognize that at great cost, you have made it possible for me to have a second chance when I mess up my life and hurt those around me. But then sometimes I confuse you with others, others who have helped me or challenged me, great writers, great teachers and writers, prophets and priests, parents and authorities. This can be helpful. Sometimes they do point me to you. But sometimes I can't see through the image they present, and my relationship with you gets blurred. Sometimes I'm not sure if I know you at all. I begin to get a sense of who you are, but then like Peter, I misunderstand your mission or your message or what you really want from me. Who do I say you are, Jesus? You are the one I have come to love as God. You are the one I am learning to recognize and will give eternity to know. You are the unfathomable mystery that is always beyond my ability to understand. You are the Christ, the Amen. Son of the living. Amen. Join them in singing this last song. Oh, my God. 
Y'all can be seated. So here is why we're having this conversation. This morning, um, and I'm going to invite Stan up here just in a moment, um, but like, like I said, this week I was asked twice. Um, once, what about our system of beliefs, and the other was, you know, what kind of church um, are you? And if you're wondering, our grow values are actually on every one of your tables. There's a little blue piece of paper that are attached to that clipboard, um, but we put those out there every week. But I started using the word, the words in this uh, this conversation like interdenominational, and I used the word progressive, and I could tell right away that those words had meaning to them that it perhaps were not what they were looking for. Um, but I get this question from time to time. Uh, it's been my experience, though, that it's not a question of I want to get to know you more. I want to get to see how we might fit at your church and partner with you in changing lives in uh, in Western North Carolina. Um, it's more of a you know, tell me what you believe so I can see if we disagree. You know, you know, the, the church has been amazing at communicating what we're against. We've done very poorly at communicating what we're for. And we've said that years ago that that's not what we want to be. We want people to know what we're for, not just what we're against. Um, and I can tell that those questions come and, and people want to know that. We had two families that have uh, visited us and maybe more since um, since our um, uh, announcement in October, and uh, they had conversations with two of the staff members. They came to visit. Um, hey, we're here. We're checking out uh, a place. We're moving here. We want to see about a church, or we're here at our vacation home, and we want to check you guys out. And at some point in their conversation, in those few moments, the the LGBTQ question came up, and both those families um, left before the service started. Um, didn't even get a chance for me to give them a reason to leave um, when I spoke. Um, just just left, you know, and, and I hate that. I hate that as a pastor to see that because I'm like, you don't even, you don't want to hear the heart behind who we are or what we're doing. Um, this journey we've been on, we knew when we made this decision that it was going to be painful and we were going to lose people. Um, and we had already lost a lot of people prior to this. I mean, we went through what felt like a plague um, and then, then we had COVID. Um, and so you might get that joke. Um, <laughs> so but, but we went through a lot, and we lost a lot of people. And when this came up and uh, that we were going to have this conversation and people were leaving, I genuinely wanted everyone to stay and to listen and to have um, open ears and open hearts and open minds and to hold their beliefs with open hands and to, to sit in the tension of, this doesn't sound like what I've been taught. But to what the, the Naomi uh, Washington says this, if you could suspend the interpretation that you've been handed down as a child, if we could just sit in that tension and see what we're about and why we're making this decision, you know, then they, they too may change their minds. They may change their hearts um, and see that this was the right thing for us to do. But most people left before we had the conversation that we're leaving. And so I'm sensitive to when people ask the question, well, what's your belief system or what's your church about? Because I hear another question being asked. And so when I say the word progressive, I might not be communicating the message that I want to communicate. And so I want to invite Stan up here on stage to join me. And help me welcome Stan to the stage. So, so I started thinking, you know, hey, we're going to go into the series. We're talking about presence and practice. Um, what it looks like to live out our faith together. But, I, but these two questions hit me this week, and I'm like, maybe we need to like go back and just, just talk a little bit about who we are and why we are and what we're doing out here and what some of these words might mean. Um, and so I'm like, well, you know, voices like uh, Richard Rohr and Brian McLaren and Rob Bell and Tony Jones and Rachel Held Evans, all these mind, these voices started coming back to my mind of people that have been influenced in this conversation. But if I thought about who was the one person that talks about this the most that I get, that I love, and I, I steal all of his things that he says, um, is Stan Mitchell. And I'm like, man, 
I'm just going to listen to some of his messages and just regurgitate it on Sunday morning. Um, and then I'm, I'm doing this, I'm putting some notes together, and I'm on the phone, and I know Santa said to me, hey, man, I want to come back as soon as I can to your community and hang out and talk. And so I text him, I'm like, hey, would you like to come back? We're doing this series, and I'd love to, for you to talk. Um, and he said, well, I can come this week or uh, a week in June. And I said, well, both. Um, and so uh, he agreed to come this week, and I'm like, can I ask you some questions? Can we, can we talk about this? Because I feel like you communicate this so well, and as opposed to me stealing everything you've said, how about you say it? And then I look just as smart because it's the same stage. They say the first time you <laughs> quote somebody, you say, you know, Stan Mitchell said, and the second time you say, you know, someone said, and the third time you say, you know, I was thinking the other day. <laughs> I've heard it said. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, so we're going to do that. So I'm going to ask Stan some question and we may go over a little bit of time because I look at the clock now. And so um, we'll go a, a little bit longer. Um, that's okay. There's plenty for the kids to do up there. Um, but give me some time here and let's ask some questions. But here's what we're going to do. We're also going to put a number on the screen. If you have a question, maybe you remember Stan from when he came before, or you just want to ask a question according to this topic uh, or something else, just text it to me. I'll, I'll see it and I'll, I'll filter it. Um, and we'll see about if we can fit some of these questions in. But if you have a question for me or for Stan, um, there's a phone number on there. That phone number is a burner phone. Um, do not use it throughout the week. <laughs> All right, so uh, first we're going to start with some wordplay because I think these are some of the words that we're going to talk about in this conversation. Um, so help me out with this. The word evangelical. You hear that? What does that mean to you? Uh, it's uh, a transliterated word from Greek. Translation is word for word. Transliteration is when you just go letter to letter. So it's actually a Greek word, uh, euangelion, that meant good news. I still consider myself deeply evangelical. When it comes to words... Words are frail on one hand and powerful on the other hand. Words are intended to communicate, but they only communicate by pointing, right? If I point to the moon, my finger's not the moon. The problem is some people love words so much that when they point to the moon, they start looking at their finger and they become experts on the finger and they lose the experience. If I say I love peach cobbler, I haven't given you the experience of peach cobbler. I've just pointed you to that. Words are powerful in that they point. They're frail in that they point. Words like evangelical are the same. There are some people, I'm a sentimentalist, I'm nostalgic. I'm sentimental and nostalgic about everything. I have a low dew point. I love chick flicks. I cry. I listen to bread from the 70s, Air Supply, Barry Manilow, all of that. And I'm heterosexual, so it's, it's a bit of an enigma. But I am a sensitive person who's nostalgic. I love words. There are other people who have a different personality that words are associated and connected to bad parts of their life and the easiest thing to do is to use that word as a scapegoat, which is fine. Jettison the word and get a fresh word, right? Always moving on to a fresh word. I like words like evangelical. I consider myself evangelical because I deeply believe in the good news of Jesus. Give us a little bit of context to your experience of Christianity. That's what I wanted to start with. Of like, who, who's Dan Mitchell? Like, what's your... Well, uh, in terms of Christianity, I'm five generations deep on one side, three generations deep on the other side, old time Pentecostal. Um, I, our, our, we thought the assembly of God were liberal, right? So I grew up in a holiness Pentecostal tradition. Um, our women couldn't cut their hair. Any, anytime our women left and went to the assembly of God, we never went to the Baptist, but if we backslid, we could kind of go to the assembly of God. When our women cut their hair, they always said they were delivered from bondage. So that's the world I come from. I, it was, it was a, it, but uh, we were just talking before, when you start coming out of a world like that, the immediate reaction is to look back at the things that you think that world got wrong. But I, I don't look at that world today. I look at, you know, you come out of that and you think, man, that was poison. Later in life you realize it was water with contaminants. And there's no water without contaminants. It kept me alive. It hydrated me in my soul. It made me a little bit sick, but I was able to detox from the things that made me sick. And frankly, there's no church, there's no system that doesn't have some contaminants. So I, I love that world from whence I come. I do like the idea of spiral dynamics that we are not graduating and rejecting. We are transcending and including. And as you move, that still is a deep part of my life and many of the values from that world. So I grew up uh, in the Assembly of God, went to college there. We, we formed a church outside of there that we were all Assemblies of God 
pastors, but we were non-denominational church. Moved up to Michigan, joined a church that were, the pastors there were Nazarene, this is where I met Justin, but they were non-denominational church. We took this job in 2006, they had just uh, two years prior, had gone from Baptist to non-denominational, that's what this church was, and so since 2006, this is non-denominational. Um, but in the last eight years, six years, um, we've kind of quit using that word, and we've, we've chosen a word, interdenominational. And you've talked about this word, too, before. What does that word mean, inter, interdenominational? It means to appreciate all of the places that we come from. Just the, the same appreciation I was just expressing to my Pentecostal upbringing. We, at some point in the non-denominational movement, we looked at the word non, and it felt negative in tone, right? Non, to be dismissive of or to be anti or to be against, um, to uh, almost make an unreality. And so instead of being non-denominational against denominations, we are interdenominational. That means you can come from your background, any of the thousands of denominations, and we won't just tolerate you. We will appreciate you and listen because the body of Christ is a long, rich history. And whether you're Baptist, Episcopalian, Pentecostal, the reason every denomination started was because there was some fresh idea, some sense that maybe the body of Christ had been dismissing or ignoring a particular element that it needed to. Most good movements that last, most good denominations that last started with some fresh spark off the grinding wheel of truth. The reality is that spark can eventually cool down and you can get institutionalization. But interdenominational says, let's go back to what it was that sparked the Anabaptist, that sparked the Methodist Wesleyan movement that we come from, that sparked the Pentecostal movement. There's good stuff in that, so let's listen to one another. Uh, the word hermeneutic. Hermeneutic's a, a fancy word. That's just, you know, when I go to my dentist, I don't want her to use words from dental school. I mean, tell me why my tooth hurts and don't I, you're not going to impress me with big words so as ministers we don't need to try to impress people with big words hermeneutic is a good word though you and i both learned it in school it simply means the art and science of interpretation we all do hermeneutics we are always interpreting situations context and words and within a religious setting uh, hermeneutic is how we interpret and specifically we've got two things that uh, this church has been deeply involved in uh, recently and that is the interpretation of experience and the interpretation of a text obviously you can't be a christian without deeply valuing at some level the bible and that's when we're talking hermeneutics how do we read this text and how do we make this text align with scripture remember on the day of pentecost pentecostals the day of pentecost when the Holy Spirit fell, that was an experience, and it was an experience they had never seen before. The Holy Spirit fell, tongues of fire on their head, sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind, 120 believers like Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his disciples in an upper room. And when the Holy Spirit falls, something happens that they did not predict. They spoke in the languages of those that were round about. Uh, there was a diaspora of Jews throughout the Mediterranean world. They were there in Jerusalem for a holiday. And when these 120 came out, they were speaking in these languages that the 120 are, are the nations around recognized. When Peter stood up to give an answer of what was happening, because it was astonishing, the people in the crowd were like, this on one hand kind of looks supernatural, on the other hand it looks like they're drunk. Peter, Peter did uh, at least a seminal form of what we always are doing in terms of hermeneutics. Peter stood up, and as a faithful Christian, he said this, the experience, is that which was spoken. And part of the Christian faith, when it comes to interpretation, you also listed reason and tradition. tradition. We are always trying to put our this and our that together. This experience, families that had a gay child, they have four children, their gay child is the one that's been sitting on the front row of the church loving Jesus their whole life. How does our this line up with our that which was spoken? That's the, herman, that's the collision of two horizons, and it's not always easy, but that's what hermeneutics are, the interpretation of experience, tradition, reason, scripture in a context. So we end up with what we call as an orthodox, an orthodoxy which is our right. doctrine, our belief system. 
Orthodox? Yeah. Orthodox. I mean, you know, in the, it's interesting. Orthodox was a, a word that, if you look at the etymology, how the word developed, it meant, if you break down the compound word, it meant right worship. Isn't that interesting? I mean, when I think of Orthodox, our common usage is right belief or right doctrine. And yet orthodoxus was right worship. That goes, it makes some sense because in the early, earliest centuries of the church, most of our people, a large percentage, far more than the preponderance, the vast majority of the people in the church were not literate. And so the way we taught doctrine, the way we taught theology was through liturgy, the reading, the antiphonal reading of the people and the leader. And most of that could not be read off of a screen. It had to be memorized. And so people, people believed what they said in worship. And for me, I, the only part of orthodoxus, orthodoxy that is bothersome to me is, is that first word, right. Right worship or right doctrine. I, I think... I think we need to really revisit not as much what worship and doctrine means. That's pretty simple to me. I have a sense of awe toward God. I have a sense of idea about God and life. But right, that word has haunted me because I grew up in a tradition that was trying so hard to get it right because our eternal consequence depended upon getting it right. And, and, and we were so fearful of what it meant to be right and that's why I said in the documentary I think when Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount said blessed are those who are hungry who are thirsty who are peacemakers who are suffering who are honest who are sincere dispositions of heart more than positions of mind may have more to do what right with what right worship right practice actually means I'm gonna lump some of these together here um, so the next two words liberal and conservative. Um, I think people hear the word progressive or liberal and immediately red flags go up. All of a sudden politics are kind of, in religion are colliding. Um, people are not comfortable anymore. Um, but words are important. Like you said, words can be dividing at the same time. And um, we talked about this last night. The, the, the progressive word is more of an adjective than it is a noun. So how fitting that liberal conservative piece, what is progressive Christianity? Like what how would you answer that question? Well, we all know that liberal or conservative, I mean, that those are two words that make family reunions go really well, right? <laughs> What's still saying? The, the most common phrase at a family reunion is, what do you mean by that? Because um, we're always so sensitive about these things. Liberal or conservative are two words that are just about worn out in terms of their effectiveness. As a sentimentalist, I like reclaiming words fluffing and powdering them, refreshing them, and making them new. If there are two words that are just about worn out, it's liberal and conservative, because these words are used in two of the most divisive areas of our life in terms of our family and friends, and that's religion and politics. They don't always mean the same in both. Again, as one who reclaims words, for me, I, we all know liberal means left and conservative means right, and people are pretty clear on what that spectrum looks like. I believe, I mean, I'm called a liberal pejoratively, and I'm not word playing here. I am doing my best to be conservative. Because for me, to be conservative means to conserve, in a Christian setting, I am doing my best to conserve what I believe is the heart of Jesus. And the word liberal, at its simplest meaning, simply means wideness of birth wideness of heart, wideness of mind. To be liberal in your giving means to be wide and broad in your giving. So I don't believe liberal and conservative have to be at opposite ends of the spectrum. My liberalness, my wideness of heart and mind is because that is exactly who I believe the person of Jesus was. The word progressive is just a synonym because liberal was starting to get worn out, just like the word tradition is a, is, is a is a synonym for conservative because the words are getting worn out. The problem with continuing to replace one word with another is you're not replacing the ideas underneath those words. 
and you may jettison the words and come up with fresh words to try to come together, but you and your dad, you and your mom, you and your brother, you and your friend are still going to have to sit down and share this idea and be able to do it in a way that's wide-hearted, that is faithful, and yet above all is kind. Um, so I like the word progressive, um, and we can talk more about that, what that means, theology, but, uh, and I, I will say this, liberal conservative spectrum in theology, there is some correlation to politics, but it's not a perfect correlation. And a lot of my friends on both sides don't like this, but it is the reality for me. I, I have liberal theological friends who are conservative politically and vice versa. And this cookie cutting and just using those words to you know, label everything uh, is quite, that's one of the frailties of words and it's not true. So how would you explain, what would you say to someone coming out of a tradition um, where they hear the word progressive and they, the red flags were like, to get them through the door to, to like not be afraid? Like what would you say to your, at the family reunion or what would you say to the person visiting on a Sunday morning that when you say, hey, we're probably more of a progressive church, what do we want to say? Well, the first thing that I want in relationship to my dad or my mom or my friends, anybody, you know, Number one, I don't want to have a conversation that they don't want to have. I, I, I no longer feel like I'm God's evangelical SWAT team that's supposed to correct everybody. I think everybody is on their journey. And I don't appreciate it when somebody is knocking down my door trying to impose their beliefs upon me. I would rather meet people relationally and lovingly. I mean, a lot of you know if you follow me on Facebook, I spend two weeks or two days every week in Arkansas with my dad and my mom because she has dementia and it's, a, it's the most beautiful two days because my dad and I went in very opposite directions politically and theologically the last 10 years, and it's been very hurtful for us. Reconnecting at the intersection of grace called mom has been very lovely for me. And to meet there in our humanness is, is I, I, I think both of us understand one another better. Our conversations are a whole lot better because we've met on a human level as, as opposed to this dry ideological level. So I, I say that as the underpinnings of I don't feel a need to convert anybody anymore. Um, and it, it's not that I don't think there are ideas that are better than others, but nobody converted me. No one conversation converted me. No one book converted me. And I guarantee you, nobody impacted me who came into my life with the mission to impact me. But I can say this, conversations have built up. Relationships have built up. Experiences have built up that have changed me over time. But to look back and remember the straw that broke the camel's back in my spirit, there was no one person. So if I'm in a defensive mode of having to defend the word progressive, I, I don't do a lot of verbal work there. I generally come back to try to reestablish the relationship. I looked at my dad two years ago when all this began with my mom and I, I said, you know, I, I don't know why you and I have become so distant. We've been so close for so long, why we can't talk about things. My, I looked at my dad and I said, you know, my brother, my older brother by two years, Steve, he left Christianity 35 years ago, and you and him, y'all are incredibly close. Why are y'all so close and you and I can't even talk? My dad looked at me and he said, well, he's my son. I said, well, what am I? And my dad looked at me and he said, well, you've always been our pastor. And I said, well, I would like to resign. And he looked at me and he said, you don't have to, I already fired you. <laughs> and I looked at him and said, so I can go back to being your son? And he said, he said, we would love that. You've always been the apple of our eye. So I've been my dad's son again, not a progressive preacher for the last two years. And we talk about Cardinal baseball and mom's dementia and Uncle Philden's prostate problems. And, and did you know some of the best conversations have grown out of that that aren't defending words and 
quibbling over spectrums and all of that. Um, and in that, all I'm saying is, I, I think the only place real change happens is when people meet in a mutual loving humanity and have conversations out of that. And I will say, as I meet with them, and as I come to this issue of what's it mean, because my dad has said, you know what, what's that mean, progressive Christianity? I don't try to go to the antithetical and prove where we're different. I try to find common ground and prove where we're the same. So with most evangelicals, like the Pentecostal family I come from, I don't look at them and say, well, this is something we're doing totally different that y'all have never done before. I, I, I would look at my dad and say, you know, dad, progressive, it's definitely a small P. It's, it's not a capital P. The only capital letter in my life would be Christian. That's a capital C. Pentecostal Baptist, Episcopal Catholic, Protestant Lutheran, Missouri Synod, Wisconsin Synod, Free Will Baptist, General Baptist, Assembly of God, Church of God, Church of God of Prophecy, Church of God out of Anderson. Those all need to move to adjectival status. Those aren't the nouns. Christian is. And all of those denominations were in some way honoring this adjective called progressive. I don't know one denomination, one group that started because they wanted to digress. I know our people, our Pentecostal people, were a progressive movement at the beginning of the 20th century birthed out of Wesleyanism, which was itself a progressive movement birthed out of Protestantism. Nobody was wanting to digress. All of them were catching something in the biblical text that maybe we felt like hadn't been emphasized. And Dad, you remember as Pentecostals growing up in that, great-grandparents, great-great-grandparents, we were the church on the other side of the track. People thought we were heretical. I mean, but we knew we had caught hold of something. And we felt like we were progressing the Christian church. So there's common ground to be found as opposed to arguments to be had. And I think that's how we have to be careful in talking about these things. Remember, in the beginning was the word, John said. And the word was put in print set and it was black letters on a white page bound in books. No. The word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And that word named Jesus did not replace himself with a leather bound book. As much as I love that leather bound book, he replaced himself with the body of Christ. Humans, people. So meet there if you can and find common ground. And so per the word progressive, I would tell my dad, that's, that's the movement we come from. That's what Pentecostalism was, was an effort to progress the body of Christ, not by changing it, but by saying, hey, I think we've been, those of you from Church of Christ background or Christian church, disciples of Christ, that was a restoration movement. Stone and Campbell led in the 1830s. It was a group of people who looked and said, there's some stuff in scripture that I think we've kind of been overlooking or not emphasizing enough. That's all, that's the heart of Christianity. So a phrase that you and I said earlier, I, I am liberally trying to conserve the heart of Jesus. And my progressivism is traditional because I believe progressivism is the heart of exactly what is the tradition of Christianity. So you brought up scripture. This is the biggest criticism I think uh, I hear from, you know, the outside is that the progressive Christian or, again, small p, big C, they don't view, have a, like, respect for the Bible. They don't like the Bible. They don't read the Bible. They don't take it literally or whatever it is. But we have some quarter, sort of skewed uh, thought on scripture. So for you, what role does it play in the life of progressive? What hermeneutic? for reading the Bible do you use? Um, talk a little bit about scripture. And yeah, well, this is, not, this is not a political statement efforting to find common ground. This is an easy common ground to find for me. I, I think I value the scripture as much or more than I ever did. I may, I may see it differently than I once did, but I only see it differently because of how much I deeply value it. In terms of those on the other side of the fence of a lot of these issues, those who wouldn't consider themselves liberal or progressive or whatever those words are, 
their claim that those on our side of the fence or on us, hopefully there's not a fence, on our side of the, uh, of the yard have dismissed scripture. I just want to say, Jesus said, agree with your adversary quickly that it might be well with you. There are places you have to agree with your adversary. And I want to say, I get that argument. Because I do think some of the earlier iterations of a more progressive interpretation of Christianity came across as dismissive mm -hmm. of the biblical text. I do think as literary criticism, biblical criticism advanced in the 17th, 18th, 19th century coming out of the enlightenment, just like criticism advanced in biology and astrophysics and chemistry and all the other disciplines, as it advanced, I think there was a period, first couple of hundred years of a more liberal uh, per interpretation where we didn't know what to do with the Bible because we had interpreted it one way for so long. I do think the progressive movement um, that's coming out of evangelical settings, I think one of the things that we're bringing with us is an ardor, a zeal, and a love for the text. And we're saying to the forerunners in liberal Christianity, the Bible actually doesn't have to be dismissed. It actually says this stuff if you give it a chance. So, which leads to my next question. It was a question that came out from the crowd. I'm um, talking about this idea that, you know, were these things addressed in, you know, the Bible, the church that Jesus talks about, that's first century. Um, it seems now that we're just migrating to current hot topics in culture. Um, when, we, when we say we, we go back to the scriptures to ask questions like, have we got it right? Have we missed something here? Um, are we changing God's mind on current things we're talking about? I mean, are we, were, were these things that Jesus talked about? Like, where do we have that room to change our minds? Yeah, so the, the reality is the tradition of Christianity is deeply, is deeply connected to this idea of progressive revelation. I mean, the bottom line is, and, and, and Jewish people feel this from us deeply, Christianity is built on the idea of progressive revelation because we've been very dismissive to our Jewish roots for a long time that somehow they just labored from Abraham through Moses on through the prophets to build a platform to us to get everything right. And so while I do believe this Jewish rabbi, this son of God named Jesus was a, 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 a obviously a progressive form of revelation, I think we've got to be very careful that progressive revelation is not dismissive of that which came before. Because if you do move to seven from five, seven's not a contradiction of five, is it? Five is a part of seven. You can't have seven without five. You take five away from seven, and seven all of a sudden is two. And so I think there's a, a lot, hopefully we're always, again, whether it's economics, chemistry, astrophysics, biology, botany, there's no discipline known to man that is not accruing information and we're standing on the shoulders and the accumulated wisdom of those that have gone before us. And, and so Christianity is not replaceive of Judaism, but Christianity, as best I can tell, was... To, to take that and hold it within it and continue to grow. Now, here's the problem with the idea of progressive revelation. It was built into the fabric of our church. And this is not a problem, it's our response to this. Think about it. The early church, established on the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit falls, 120 people are filled with the Holy Spirit. Great. Peter stands up and says, this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, now this is what Peter said. In the last days, saith God, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. When Peter said that, when Peter quoted Joel and said, what you just saw here was God's promise to pour out his spirit on all flesh. Somebody tell me what the word all means. It means all. But Peter understood all incompletely, just like our founding fathers in this country, when they said all men are created equal, they did not fathom that they were talking about females. And they didn't fathom that they were talking about people of color. They said something that had a greater capacity than they even currently had to understand. 
When Isaiah wrote Isaiah 53 and said he will be like a tender shoot out of dry ground and there will be no form of comeliness that we will know him. He will be wounded for our transgressions and bruised for our iniquity. The man who penned those words did not see a cross and a crucified Lord. He saw something within his context that made that make sense for him. But we are a we are a people, the Jewish Christian people, we are a people who know what it is to live with the text and to watch that text in living form expand our minds. It's not the text that's changing, it's our capacity to see the fullness of the text that's changing. When Peter said, this that I've seen is that which was spoken, God's going to pour out his spirit on all flesh. If you would have asked Peter to define what he meant practically by all flesh, he would have somehow made a statement that that outpouring, that allness was related to Jewish people. But he didn't say, Joel didn't say all Jewish people. And yet the church persisted, including Peter, for a couple of years believing the outpouring of the Spirit could only happen to all Jews. Now all people could have the Spirit, but they had to convert to Judaism first. And then one day, God gave Peter a rooftop vision, a dream. And Peter argued with God. And you know the story. We've used it a lot around here. After arguing with God, Peter begrudgingly gave in, shared the good news, the euangelion, the evangelical, shared it with Gentile people. Up until that moment, it went something like this. You share the gospel, People repent, change their mind, you water baptism, and then the spirit falls, right? Yes. Didn't happen there. Peter shared the gospel, and instead of water baptizing them, the Holy Spirit fell on Gentiles. And Peter's, I, Joel didn't change, but Peter's understanding of Joel changed because he just saw the Holy Spirit fall, and his definition of all just expanded. And the Bible says Peter looked around at his Jewish Christian brothers and said, if God just poured out his spirit on them, how do we continue to forbid them water? Peter was sharing the gospel with people that he was internally forbidding to be baptized. And then he said, wait a minute, God just baptized him with his spirit. How in the world can we not baptize him with our water? And he baptized them with water, went back, reported it to James, the brother of Jesus, the head of the Jerusalem church, who was full of the Holy Spirit. You want progressive? James looked at Peter and said, I don't want to hear about baptism. I don't want to hear about, you shouldn't even have eaten with those people. That's Christianity. Christianity doesn't have to wait to the 21st century and LGBTQ people, the 20th century and women and divorcees, the 19th century and chattel slavery. We don't have to wait till we almost burned Copernicus and Galileo at the stake for saying it's a heliocentric solar system and the sun's at the center. We don't have to wait for that. Right out of the chute, we forbade the definition of all be the true definition by God of all. James said you shouldn't even have eaten with them. Peter, this is hermeneutic, Peter didn't argue the text. Peter suspended the text, reported the experience, looked at James and said, I know, brother, but I don't know what to do with this. I saw the Holy Spirit fall on them as it did on us in the beginning. And that experience seemingly is contradicting our understanding of this text. Now we can do two things. We can dismiss the experience and look at people that God has poured his spirit out on and say, didn't really happen. We used to say that. This is almost blasphemous. But when my family who were UPC, Oneness Pentecostal, would look at our Assembly of God, Church of God people, and they would talk about, hey, we've got the Holy Ghost too. We, we would behind their backs say they don't have the same Holy Ghost we have. Think about that. That sounds funny. That's horrible. They don't have the same Holy Ghost we have. They don't have the same Jesus we have. You can either dismiss the experience, which is sophomoreish and juvenile and not Christian, or you can do something else, and they're right. I think we did this to some extent in the liberal progressive movement in the beginning. 
you can dismiss the text and say, well, that's an embarrassment. Or you can do the mature thing and allow the experience to drive you back to the text and say, have we read this most faithfully today? So rooted in the tradition of Christianity is the progressive hermeneutic that says we are always and ever willing for reason, experience, to drive us back to the text asking the question, have we read this most faithfully today? Because we have a long history of having epiphanous moments where the experience drives us back to the text and Peter stands up and says, I'll tell you this, we've read Joel for seven centuries, but this that you're seeing is that which was spoken seven centuries ago. That's progressivism, that's Christianity. Okay, so Joel, maybe Peter, it sounds like all of us have somewhat of a uh, changing our mind experience through our tradition. But what about Jesus? Did, but he, he didn't change, right? He didn't like look at it and... Jesus actually set up the idea of progressivism and he set it up in two places. If you really want the heart of progressivism, I just gave you a story from Acts. That's an extension of the true heart of the progressive element. Uh, listen, I won't say this about progressive Christianity. I don't like progressive Christianity, capital P, capital C. You know what that feels like to me? Now, it's not untrue that Christianity is progressive, but it's a bit misleading. That would be like somebody saying, we started a new, new uh, denomination and it's compassionate Christianity. You see the unnecessary nature of that? Christianity itself is compassionate. And if your Christianity is not compassionate, obviously it's not Christianity. So within Christianity is the idea of compassion and love. So I'm going to start a new denomination. I'm going to start it. I'm going to be the overseer. It's called humble Christianity. Well, that denomination just reversed itself. But rooted in Christianity is the idea of progressive. So it's redundant. That's what I'm trying to say. To say progressive Christianity, it's like redundant. Of course, compassionate Christianity. Well, of course it's compassionate Christianity. If you've got to say it, then you probably have a problem. But Jesus built the foundation of progressivism. If you want the scriptures for it, there's two. The first is the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus, in the Sermon on the Mount, knows that there are religious leaders there who are traditionalist. Now, I will say this about the rabbinic tradition. It was pretty progressive because in the rabbinic tradition, there was this midrashic form where they were arguing the text and ever believing that it would unfold. And, but Jesus, in the Sermon on the Mount, five times said, now listen to this, he's talking to the crowd, and he, five times he said, you heard the text say but I say unto you after doing that five times the religious leaders looked at him and said why would you contradict the text L literally why would you contradict Moses Jesus was able to look at them and say you're proving my point right now because that's not what I said. They were like, yes, you did. You just contradicted Moses. You said Moses said, but I say. Jesus said, see there, you didn't hear me. Jesus said five times, you heard that Moses said, but I say to you, Jesus said, I didn't say Moses said, but I say, I say you heard. The problem isn't in what Moses said, the problem is in what? You're hearing. Jesus said, so I am not here to destroy Moses. I'm here to reinforce Moses and save him from any more poor interpretation. So if Jesus did anything, Jesus showed us that the progressive development of the text is not in its changing, it's in our capacity to hear it. So that's one. The second was on the eve of his crucifixion in John 14. This is with his nearest friends. Judas is gone. 
And Jesus, with his closest disciples, looked at them and said, I have many things I want to tell you. Does anybody remember what he said next? He said, but you can't bear them. Anybody who's raised children understand that. I have a 23-year-old and a 16-year-old. I'm saying things to him I'm not saying to her yet. It's not because it's true for him and not true for her. It's because her capacity at 16 is not his capacity at 23. And that's especially true when your children are really small. I have many things to tell you, but you can't bear them now. God's not... The heart of progressivism is not God playing cat and mouse with us. It's God accommodating the reality of human growth. God said, but when the Holy Spirit comes, here's the heart, this is the text. When the Holy Spirit comes, the Holy Spirit will lead and guide you into all truth. And Jesus even said, get this, the Holy Spirit will tell you all things about me. In other words, after Jesus was gone, they would learn more about Jesus than when they were with him. The question, and I don't have one conservative evangelical friend who disagrees with anything I just said. The question becomes, if you want the real question, the question is, okay, but did that process of unfolding truth end at some point and we no longer have access to it. Our roots as Pentecostals do not indicate that. Our roots as leaders in LGBTQ affirmation does not indicate that. The treatment of women, especially women who've been abused and the issue of divorce does not indicate that. Women in ministry does not indicate that. Chattel slavery, segregation, race relations do not indicate that. Church, Protestant Reformation does not indicate that. If anything, church history shows us a church that has continued to have the capacity to hear the Holy Spirit, not change the text, but unfold it in ways that we could not. God didn't change God's mind on slavery in the 19th century. We heard it say. So I, for one, think, and, and I, I do understand the limits and the frailty of this. I think we have to be open to the idea of progressive revelation continuing. Do I believe there are inherent dangers in that? Absolutely. But I also know there are inherent dangers in not allowing that process to continue and 19 centuries of slavery proves that there are real dangers because when somebody looks at me on the LGBTQ issue and says Stan on this one the Bible's clear I don't look back at them and say no it's not I look back at them and say I get it but I need you to tell me talking to my Pentecostal family now, and Pentecostals have always allowed women in ministry. Okay, I'm going to give it to you. The Bible's clear. Tell me if this is clear. I do not allow women to speak in church, nor to take any position of authority where men would be under them, subordinate. Why, Paul? Because Adam was first formed, then Eve. And Adam wasn't deceived. He sinned, but he didn't sin because he was deceived. Eve was deceived. In other words, as Peter would later reinterpret that text, women have a weakness of mind. And a few days a month, they really, a dismissive, misogynistic attitude toward women embedded in that... Tell me if that's not clear. Paul wasn't appealing to the Mosaic law. He went all the way back to Adam and Eve and said before sin, if it were just the fact that Adam was formed first, then Eve. That's the reason. And if that's not enough, forget the law. She was frail and easily led away. And you can't 
have people like that, specifically female in leadership. Tell me if that's clear. You want one more clear one? 1 Peter 2, slaves be submissive to your masters, even if they beat you without cause. So this text about gay people are clear. Tell me if this is clear. Slaves, be submissive to your masters, even if they beat you without cause. For to this you were called by Christ. That's 1 Peter 2. That's the guy who spoke the message on the day of Pentecost. You think that's clear? I'll tell you how clear it is. 19 centuries later, the majority of the Christian church was still defending chattel slavery on the grounds of the biblical text. So the church has a long history of saying the Bible's clear. But the word is made flesh and the body of Christ has got to listen to more than just ancient traditional interpretations of the text. We have to be open. <clears throat> Time has a way of growing ears on our hearts and eyes on our souls. Time allows us to see and hear things in ways we couldn't before is what you said. Uh, in one of your messages, and so I mean that I feel like that's, that's what it. we just um, we we're running out of time. Um, what I wanted to do, and what we're gonna what we're gonna do is we're gonna talk more about this in the upcoming weeks as well as talking about baptism and water baptism, what that means for us and for you and for those who want to be a part of that. Our plan is this June to have a baptism service. We've spent a few years since we've had that, um, just with COVID, and so our plan is to get back to that this June. And so we're gonna be talking about that in here. We'll be, our kids program will be talking about it. I'd love for you to come back and talk about it if you're available. Um, I'll put you on the spot. Um, but I'd love for you uh, maybe in the beginning of June to come back because that was going to be one of my next questions was just give me some time on that. But we don't have it. So I need you to come back, Stan, um, for that. But I want to close this in prayer. Help me thank Stan for being here. Um, thank you. Let me uh, close us in this last prayer and uh, and you guys can... Uh, head out. Thank you for being a part of it. Thank you for being patient. I know we went a lot longer than normal, but uh, man, he has some good stuff to say, doesn't he? Um, this prayer is called, We Are the Church, and I want this to be our prayer for us as we go out. So join me. We are the church, Jesus, but sometimes we fail to believe it. And so we focus more on what divides us than on your call and the unconditional welcome that joins us. May your spirit flow through us to bind and connect us in ways that neither our diversity nor our self-righteousness, nor our sin can separate. We are the body, Jesus, but sometimes we fail to act like it. And so we grow more concerned with ourselves than with others you call us to serve. May your grace and compassion flow through us to heal and embrace all who are broken and wounded. We are your messengers, Jesus, but sometimes it's easier to carry bad news or no news than to challenge the powers that be or to oppose injustice with the message of the gospel. May your prophetic voice be proclaimed in us in ways that encourage the despairing, liberate the oppressed, and hold the powerful accountable. Forgive us when we fail to be who we are, who you have called us to be, and teach us to live and to love as your presence in this world. For Christ's sake, amen. Grove, we love you. Thank you so much for being here. We'll see you next week.